Morning, folks. What a pleasure it is to be with you this morning. My name is Tyler Christensen. I'm the pastor here. So happy to see so many of you here and a happy Thanksgiving to all of you and to your families. And I hope you have uh, some wonderful plans in store this week. We've been talking about Thanksgiving in general and gratitude more specifically throughout the last few weeks. We're going to continue on that theme and finish it today because as Andrew so rudely reminded us, next week's Advent. So I love the season of Advent. I'm excited it's here. And, you know, I wish I had a few more weeks in between, but it's going to be a great start of the countdown of four weeks of Advent up until Christmas Eve. So if you want to follow along in your Bible this morning, I'll be reading from the 28th chapter of Genesis. And don't worry if you don't have one with you. We've got the words on the screen if you wish to follow along. This is a story that uh, for many of you will be sort of uh, familiar. There's, there's songs based on this. There's a carnival game that I've not been very successful at based on this story. Um, and well, let's have a look. So from Genesis 28, starting with the 10th chapter. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, He placed it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching up to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head, and he set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called the place Bethel, but the name of the city was Lutz at at first. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, if God will be with me, And will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give one tenth to you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is not the first we hear of Jacob in Genesis. Jacob starts off a a few chapters before this. Interesting story. Um, Let me give you a little primer on this, if this is a story that you haven't heard for a while or maybe never heard it. But So Jacob is uh, the younger of two twin boys. Younger by a few seconds, really. His older brother Esau was born, uh, and he came out, and the Bible tells us that he was kind of hairy, and he was who's born first. And we get to hear that because remember that in this time and in in this time and place, the eldest male in the family would be the one who would receive his birthright, which meant that he got the largest share of the inheritance. If the family owned land, it would become his land one day and he would pass it on to his eldest son and so forth. So interestingly enough, we have a story where we have two twin boys and Esau is born. We're told he's a little hairy. We hear this thing about Jacob where he comes out and he's holding on to the heel of his older brother. It's as if he was trying to pull him back in and saying, no, 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 I'm going to try to get out first. He doesn't. He ends up being second. We hear a little bit more about Jacob. Um, Jacob is sort of a guy who likes to sort of hang around mom a little bit more. Esau is the guy who's kind of like more likes to hang around dad. Esau likes to go out and spend time in the outdoors. He's a hunter and sort of a, a gamesman type of guy. And one day he comes back from, as he's older, of course, he comes back from being out and doing the hunt. And he comes back, and Jacob has, his younger brother, has this wonderful meal prepared, and it smells amazing. 
And Esau says one of these things that, you know, it may just be really stupid or it may just be more like a turn of phrase. But it's like he's, if he said, you know, I'd give my left arm for that meal. But instead he says, you know, I'd give my birthright for that meal. And Jacob's like, okay, I'll trade you lunch for your inheritance. Seems like a good trade. And uh, Esau's like, yeah, whatever. So he, he, he says that, he claims it. Now he probably doesn't really mean it, but that's what he said. Time goes by, and then one day, Esau goes out for a hunt again. But before he does, his father, who is now probably getting really old, maybe a little senile, grabs him and says to him, when you come back from the hunt, have a meal prepared for me, and I'm going to give you my final blessing. So this is the moment. This is the moment where the birthright is going to be passed on to the eldest son. So he goes off to do the hunt. Meanwhile, Rebecca, the mom, grabs Jacob and says, hey, your brother's about to get the birthright. Now, I don't really understand why she plays favorites. Doesn't make me real comfortable, but she does. And she says, Jacob, here's the deal. Disguise yourself as your older brother. I'll prepare a meal. I'll prepare your father's favorite dish. And then you can go in and you can get the birthright. So they conjure up this plan together, and Jacob goes in, and he uh, grabs some animal fur, slaps it to his forearm. His father sort of grabs his arm and feels, oh, yes, my son, my son, I know who you are. I'm going to pass on this birthright to you, and let's have this meal together. And they do, and he blesses him, and he gives him the birthright, and then they know that Esau's on his way back. And he is going to be, let's just say, more than a little unhappy with what has just happened at home. Esau is so angry that he is going to kill his brother. So Jacob quick packs up a few things and bolts. He leaves to go to a faraway land where his uncle lives and he's supposed to put down roots at least for as long as necessary there, maybe forever. And so this is the setup to the story that I just read, which we probably know uh, is, is the story of Jacob's ladder. So Jacob goes and he's out in the wilderness. Maybe it's his first night sort of as a, as a refugee or, or, or as, a, as a fugitive rather. And he's out there and he comes to this place and he does what all of us would do, which is make a rock pillow. I don't really get that, but he takes a, he takes a rock and it must be standing up and then he sits it down like a pillow and he puts his head on it and to nobody's surprise, sleeping out in the cold with a, his head on a rock, he has a really strange dream. And this dream, as you heard, is about these angels going up and down this ladder. And all of a sudden, God comes to him and says, I want to tell you, I want to have a conversation with you. I know what's happened. I know that you're on your way out of town. And I'm here to tell you that someday you will return back to this place. Not maybe this place specifically, but this land. And when you come back here, your offspring, your ancestors, will be as numerous as the, as the dust of the earth, which sounds a lot like what the messengers told Abraham or Abram and Sarai. And so you're going to be a continuation of this story. The blessing is now going to be passed to you. This sort of divine birthright, which happened to Abram and Sarai, aka Abraham and Sarah, a few generations earlier, yep, now that's your story too. So don't worry, you're going to come back to this place. And I am with you. All right, let's pause for a second and just take stock of what's happened here and I'm gonna register my discomfort with the story at this point. Throughout the Old Testament, there are many stories of people who like to get sort of elevated to positions of prominence for being a little bit shifty, a little crafty, a little bit clever. Now maybe that's because the people Israel or, or, or the, this tiny little uh, underdog nation is gonna have to be a little bit clever at times. They're gonna, have to, they're gonna have to maybe massage things to their advantage. They're gonna need a little bit of help, a little leg up here and there. And so maybe this is about underdogs looking for an advantage or an edge. And maybe that's why so many of these characters in the Bible are sort of highlighted for this. But we look at this story, and we basically have Jacob, who was born second. He cooks up this, this plan, and basically he's, he's now a scoundrel. I mean, he's, he's cheated his brother. He's cheated his father. He's in cahoots with his mom, and he's just going to take off in the night. And now, hold up. God says, 
hey, I'm looking out for you, I am with you always, and you're going to get to come back to this place that's going to be all good, and I'm going to bless you. And there's part of us, I think, that hears that story and says, that doesn't quite feel right. I mean, it feels like Esau got a raw deal. He didn't choose to be born first, he just was born first. And why is it that this is the way things turn out? So sit with that for a minute. I was reading a, a story uh, in, a, in a book the other day, a woman, Christian writer, great gifted writer named um, Kathleen Norris. And she was telling a story about being at a, uh, a gate at the airport, you know, right, waiting for the airplane. It's always funny how, you know, right before the boarding time happens, how all these people just sort of descend. And there's like 30 people sitting there, and all of a sudden there's 200 when you look around in a matter of moments. And it's, it's in one of those moments, and everybody's there, and people are starting to get lined up. And he says, one of the first women in line to get on the plane, or to go down the jet bridge, she's got an infant with her. And she's got her back to the whole crowd, but she's got a baby, and the baby is positioned so that the child's face is looking backwards over the mom's shoulder. And the baby must be old enough uh, that it's sort of looking around at the crowd, right? Looking from face to face. And she describes the child as sort of locking in on somebody, and then the child doesn't move until the child sees that person make eye contact with it, and then as soon as the eye contact registers, the baby goes, <sighs> it makes a huge grin, right? And then after the person smiles back, the baby goes, okay, next target, and locks in on somebody, and then, <sighs> and, and on and on this happens. And she says it just goes through the crowd, just waiting to make eye contact, like, hey, I see you. You see me, right? This is wonderful. And even the grumpy guy who everything about his facial expression and his posture says, do not mess with me today. The baby locks in on this guy. And once the baby has this huge grin on its face, the corners of the man's mouth start to turn upward. We've all seen this happen. We've all done this with babies. We all like to play the peekaboo game on, on, you know, for the child in front of us. And, and the writer says, I think that's the way that God looks at us. You know, not seeing the shortcomings, not seeing the mistakes or the errors or the ways we've cheated or been cheated even, but just the, the look that God has, the recognition, I see you, I love you, I'm smiling upon you. And when I read that story, I was thinking about this story of, of Jacob and now all of a sudden it makes a little more sense. What if God sees Jacob not for this moment of a few events that led up to this particular story, but the whole expanse of Jacob's life before, during, and in the future? And with that kind of God vision, God sees what Jacob truly is, what his heart really is. God looks past an, an incident or an event, and God says, no, I see the big picture. I see the whole whole of who you are, and I see that, and I smile upon that, and I bless that. And truth be told, if our story, yours and mine, was written in the Bible, and we got about four chapters about us, and one of the four chapters was about all the worst things we ever did, that wouldn't be so great either. Thankfully, God's not concerned about that chapter as much as God's concerned about the bigger picture. So we may sit here and say, gosh, that feels like a, an unfair thing that God chose to side with Jacob in this story, but maybe it's that God sees a bigger picture and looks past the deficiencies, the mistakes, the sins, the problems in our lives and sees the bigger picture. Now, I, for one, want to reflect on that part of God more than the God who looks at the whole thing and says, but here's the one chapter that I'm going to hold on to and hold you back for that. So explained that way, I, I think that makes a little bit more sense. So Jacob wakes up from this dream, and he takes his rock pillow, and he's just overjoyed. 
He's overjoyed. He takes his rock and he turns it upright. He plants it in the ground. He takes some oil, dumps it over the top, sort of anointing it, making it a holy place. And he praises God and he worships spontaneously. There's no filter there. He doesn't say, I'm going to hold on to this moment, put it in my back pocket. And when I get to somewhere that's more appropriate to worship, or maybe when I'm not being chased by my brother who wants to kill me, or maybe when I get settled somewhere and build a little worship space or create an altar or whatever. No, in that moment, he says, I am overcome with gratitude and I am going to show God how grateful I am. Make a space, call it sacred, worship God, offer prayers. And he said, and I'm going to give 10% of everything I have from this moment forward. Now that's quite a turn of events. That is quite an expression of gratitude. You know, sometimes I feel like what we do in the church is we we wait for the moments that that just feel right. Or, or Or maybe that we think about worship is what we can give to God because this is what God craves from us instead of thinking about it in terms of a a response of joy on our part. The same author that I was referring to earlier, Kathleen Norris, uh, came, uh, shared this, this quote, and I think it's great. She's talking about grace and worship. Maybe that's one reason we worship, she says, to respond to grace. We praise God not to celebrate our own faith, but to give thanks for the faith that God has in us. I mean, isn't that sort of capture more closely what Jacob's situation is? It's not that, hey, uh, you know, I really need to do this because God will bless me and look favorably upon me if I offer this worship. No, it's a, it's a response to the faith that God had in him. You saw something in me that maybe I didn't see in myself. You saw something in me that clearly nobody else sees. You see something that 3,000 years later, people in a Christian church are going to read and they're going to get hung up on the first chapter, but you see everything that happened that followed that. Thank you for your grace. Here is my response. You have looked favorably upon your servant. And he says this, remember this. You were always with me even when I didn't realize it. Christian scholar Walter Brueggemann, one of the great Christian uh, writers and theologians of our time, said, you know, one of the turning points in the history of of Judaism, or really for for just sort of our monotheistic faith and, and, and all that has followed from that, says one of the turning points was everything up to that point that we know of in terms of people's worship of of pagan gods was transactional in nature. I mean, before the time of the God of Israel, people would worship God and they would try to do the right dance or utter the right words or sing the right songs or perform the right rituals or what have you or offer the right sacrifice so that God would bless them with whatever they needed. If we offer the right sacrifice, then the gods above will make the rains fall and the crops grow out of the ground. If we do this and that and the other thing, God will give us a bountiful harvest, right? And so worship was really about, I'm going to do this to suck up to the gods so that they then favor us and give us what we need in return. But the difference is, is that with the God of Israel, all of a sudden the process was reversed and it wasn't transactional anymore. It was instead, God has richly blessed us. God has offered us grace. Therefore, we want to. We can't help but worship. That's Jacob's story. You have blessed me. You have seen me differently than everybody else. You have looked upon me with favor. You have given me freely your grace out of your generous love. And I can't help but do anything but say, this place is holy, dump out my oil, offer my prayers, offer my my wealth. I'm giving it all to you. And I'm not gonna be wait, I'm not gonna wait for another moment. I'm gonna do this right here, right now. A couple years ago, there was a a book written called uh, Grateful by Diana Butler Bass, another great Christian author. She told this interesting story in the book 
I didn't really, it was one of those stories that I didn't really know where she was going with this, but I liked it. She said she was attending her daughter's high school graduation ceremony. I mean, it was a humongous school in suburban Washington, D.C. And in a, in a really richly diverse community, uh, economically diverse, racially diverse backgrounds, long, long time American families, immigrant families, the whole nine yards, right? And they were in this huge arena. And right before they read the first name, you know, the, the alphabetically the first A, A name, they, they made one of these announcements like, hey, we get hundreds of kids, so please withhold your applause until the very end, after everybody's name has been read and everybody marches across the stage and gets their diploma. Well, you know how well that went, right? So the first name right out of the gate, A, 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 gets their name read, and ah, the family goes nuts from somewhere in the arena, right? And then the next name, somebody goes crazy. Folks, please withhold your applause. There'll be time at the end to show our appreciation and gratitude. Anyway, it goes on. And it's just grating on the author's nerves. And she's like, they've been told. I mean, my gosh, why do we have to? This is going to take forever. There's a, several hundred kids here. And her husband looked around and said to her, you know, looking around, my guess is that a lot of these kids are the first ones in their family to graduate from high school. A lot of these kids are the first family of uh, American citizens in their, in their household to graduate from high school. This is a major accomplishment for most of these kids, and I don't think any warning from the microphone at the podium is gonna stop the exuberance and the celebration of these families who are here to absolutely go nuts with joy over this accomplishment. And she said as the thing went on and their cheers continued, she just sort of came to peace with it, right? And she, she said that at that point, she started to think about her own high school graduation. She said she graduated from a very homogenous community of Scottsdale, Arizona, and she said when she graduated, everybody was super quiet. You could have heard a pin drop in the auditorium where she graduated, and at the very end, a pastor from the community came forward and gave a, a prayer and a, a blessing over the graduates and then invited everybody to show their appreciation. And she said, you know, there's something wrong with having to be told that now is the time to offer gratitude. We have a national holiday on Thursday. I don't think it's out of step with Christian tradition or anything like that, but it's kind of funny that we set aside, what is it, the third Thursday in November and that's the day we're supposed to give thanks. I mean, it's almost like there's someone saying, this is the time. Now you start thinking about being grateful, right? But how different is that than the kind of Jacob response to our faith? Why would we wait till Thursday? Why would we ever wait another moment that we don't have to, when no one is saying anything to us about hold your applause. I love the unfiltered, doesn't care what anybody thinks kind of impact of the, of the people in the crowd that day at that graduation ceremony who said, I know what you're saying, but I can't hold it back. I love that Jacob wakes up and he has a dream where there's this blessing and he says, rock in the ground, pour oil on it. This, we're doing it right here. This is where the celebration is. I can't hold it back. This is what living a life in gratitude is like. Instead of waiting for it, bottling it up, holding it to the right moment, and then sharing it, what if we did it just like Lynn said? What if we looked for it in the sunrises and the sunsets? When she gave that children's message at the first service today, a ladybug crawled across the stage and it stopped the children's sermon. There's a ladybug. <sighs> you know, I mean, it was that kind of a thing. It was joy. It was like amazing. They could, couldn't have asked for a better moment, right? It was just that joy on the face of the kids. And we're talking about, let's talk about all the things we can be thankful for. What about a ladybug that walks under our noses? What about the stuffing that we're going to eat on Thursday? What about that we're healthy and then we're here? What about all the times that we could say a quick prayer under our breath serve somebody else in need, 
offer something out of generosity, smile back at a stranger, sing a song in front of our family, do a dance when we're happy, I don't know. But all of the things that we reserve, maybe for the more appropriate time. And maybe if we weren't so concerned about that, we'd actually be living lives more out of gratitude. And we might be joyful in the process. Don't wait for Thursday. Don't ever wait for Thursday. If you got joy, share it. If you're grateful, say thank you. If you are a recipient of grace, worship. Let's be people of thanksgiving, not Thursday people. Let's pray. Jesus, we turn our prayers to you because we want to be more grateful. Yet we try to be measured, we try to be reserved, we almost try to live a more stoic existence at times. We don't want to be seen as overly emotional. We don't want to cause concern among others because we're excitable. And yet there's something to be said for taking moments when they present themselves and saying thank you, offering a, a tiny bit of worship. Maybe that's reciting a favorite Bible verse. Maybe it's offering a short prayer. Maybe it's telling somebody else about the blessing in their midst that we maybe failed to see under our noses. But we know that you are good, you are working for good, that you are active and at work all the time, all around us, and as Jacob said, you were here and we didn't even realize it. So may we be people who live as people of gratitude. We don't wanna bottle that up. We wanna share it. We wanna share it with you. We wanna share it with others. We wanna worship every day of our lives because we are recipients of grace. Thank you for seeing the big picture of who we are. Thanks for looking past our deficiencies. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your love. Thank you, Jesus, for living your life for us. Amen.